Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu-rays here. And today, I am going to be talking about Scream Factory. Uh, I have talked about them before, but I have a bunch of stuff uh, that I've gotten uh, of theirs. And uh, I'm going to go a little deeper on the first two titles. There are a couple of their most recent collector's editions. And then the rest are just sort of pickups that I've had. And so some of them I've watched, some of them I haven't. Uh, but it's all kind of interesting stuff, so I wanted to talk about it all. Uh, but let's get into this here. We'll start with the de the Dead Zone. Of course, uh, adapted uh, from Stephen King. And one of my favorite adaptations of Stephen King. And I think it's pretty well liked by uh, fans of his work. Uh I don't know specifically, but it feels like one in terms of movie adaptations that goes over pretty well with people. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the Christopher Walken performance as Johnny Smith at the center of it. And also uh, David Cronenberg directing. I think that helps. Uh, the film is produced by Dino De Laurentiis and Deborah Hill. Deborah Hill, of course, worked uh, for many years with John Carpenter. And I believe she was at least, if not wholly, uh, very much partially responsible for putting the material in front of Cronenberg and getting him ultimately on board to make this movie. And I want to say it's the one of the first that he did that he didn't write, but don't quote me on that. There could have been some early stuff that maybe he didn't, but I think it was one where, um, well, there's some interviews on the disc and he says something about not being ready to do another original and that, you know, this material, I guess, kind of spoke to him. Um, but so anyway, if you don't know the dead zone, uh, okay, so this is the slip case and here is the, uh, cover there. Uh, so if you don't know the dead zone, it's basically the story of a, um, a young gentleman played by Chris Walken, who's a school teacher. He, uh, is in love with uh, another teacher played by Brooke Adams and they are sort of almost engaged like they're getting ready to be married and we meet them uh, you know at a certain point into their courtship they have not consummated their relationship they are saving uh, themselves for marriage and one night uh, Johnny drives her home she asks him to come inside he says no let's let's wait you know it good things are worth waiting for and he leaves her that night and on his way home there is a truck that turns over on the road in front of him and he ends up getting in a horrible traffic accident and it puts him in a coma and I don't want to spoil too much but I guess I, I feel like I kind of got to set it up a little bit uh, the coma lasts five years and he wakes up in an institute or a clinic and Herbert Lom is his doctor and he reveals that he's been gone for five years, he's been out, and that his girlfriend uh, slash fiance had to move on, and she is now married, and he comes to find out that she's actually uh, had a child as well. So he's he's not having a good day, we'll put it that way, and um, on top of that, he has developed some kind of psychic abilities wherein when he touches people, if there is some traumatic... Uh, incident upcoming in their life, usually pretty soon, he suddenly is hit with these flashes of what that traumatic incident is and it's almost like a jolt that he gets and in the interviews, uh, Cronenberg talks about how Walken asked him, as much as I'm quite sure Walken is not a fan of firearms nor is Cronenberg uh, he asked him to fire off a gun you know, and not tell him when he was going to do it, but whilst he was having the, uh, you know, flashes to give him a sincere jolt of surprise. So when you see Walken having these, you know, spells, if you will, he, he definitely jolts and that is, you know, him responding to a gun being shot off, uh, not Sam Fuller style, uh, definitely different than that. And so that's, I think, an interesting thing to watch for. But ultimately, the performance is just so great. It's it's so sort of sad in a way, but very humanistic. And um, so then it's just a matter of what he does or doesn't do with this new gift that he has. 
And I'm not going to go any further than that, you know, in terms of what uh, he becomes involved with or, you know, what he does. But it goes to some interesting places. There are some political bent to it that, you know, is is very interesting in any era. Uh, I think it plays, you know, when it came out, it plays 15, 20 years ago, it plays now. It always seems to be an interesting you know, point of view that the film has. Uh, But I do think it's a really interesting Cronenberg film and one that I think is just, he really handles the material well. And he he makes a choice, I think, that's different from the book and that, um, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I misunderstood, but when when Walken as Johnny has these visions, he actually sees himself in them. So it's like he's suddenly, everything is gone. And, you know, if he's in a room in a hospital bed, suddenly he's not there anymore. He's in the room or the place with the person that he's um, connecting to. And he's physically there and mentally there. And when he can't save them or something happens, he feels like he's failed them because he is so present in those moments. Um, But it's just a great performance. Um, Brooke Adams, very great in this. And I do think it's interesting that she's in two really great, you know, science fiction, horror, fantasy films, uh, about five or so years apart, interestingly, five years, because um, she's, of course, in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the remake from 1978 with Donald Sutherland, and she's great in that as well, and this is another sort of seminal, I think, um, film of the genre. And uh, so they're very good together. Uh, Martin Sheen is in this as well. I'm not going to talk about his character, but, you know, uh, there's also uh, Colleen Dewhurst, Anthony Zerby, Tom Skerritt, It's a good cast. Um, And uh, yeah, so this is a nice new collector's edition that Screen Factory's put out. And it's a new 2020 scan from the original negative, and it looks very good. And I've I've gone through and sort of highlighted all the the features, uh, and there's a lot. Uh, And I'm, I'm clear on some of them being new, but I'm not exactly sure about others. Um, oh, and just to give a little context, uh, in terms of Stephen King's adaptations that preceded this one, it was basically like Carrie, Salem's Lot, The Shining, Creep Show, and then Cujo. Uh, I think all of those come in succession before this one. So there's a lot of Stephen King going around, and this is, again, still one of the better ones in my estimation. Um, but So back to the features on this disc, which are great. You have three audio commentary tracks, which is very impressive. Uh, so you have one with the director of photography, Mark Irwin. You have a second track with film historian, Steve Haberman and filmmaker, film historian, Constantine Nasser. Then you have, uh, another one with film historian, Michael Gingold, who was of course the former editor in chief of Fangoria magazine. So you have those three, and then you have an isolated score track. That's Michael Kamen's score. And I think it was also the first time or one of the first times Cronenberg didn't work with Howard Shore, uh, which he often did, and I think it was more of an availability thing than a creative choice. But Michael Kamen's score, I think, works really well. It's 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 emotional and haunting and effective and scary where it needs to be, and it's just really well done. So you have an isolated score track with an introduction by film music critic Daniel Schweiger, um, and so that's the fourth. It's not it's not a commentary per se, but it's an extra you know bonus audio track. Uh, and then in terms of the new features, which are done by uh, Red Shirt Pictures, I think it's about 30 minutes worth of new features. And uh, you have, first you have Sarah's story, and that's an interview with Brooke Adams. That's about 11 minutes long. Uh, and it's a, you know, shot interview, you know, with her against the backdrop and everything. A lot of these will be Zoom interviews, but not in this case. I think all of these are actually shot interviews. Um, You have something called Cold Visions, Producing the Dead Zone. That's about 21 minutes. And that includes interviews with the production manager, John M. Eckert, associate producer, Jeffrey Chernov. And I think they're basically the two that that are the focus of this. And they talk about their experiences on the film and their experiences prior to the film and how they both worked with Deborah Hill and John Carpenter. And I think that sort of led into this, ultimately. Um... And they talk about getting locations, working with Dino De Laurentiis and Cronenberg, and there's a lot of great stories in there. Uh, then you have the trailers from Hell by Mick Garris, which is good. Uh, and then you have a bunch of old features that are, I want to say, 
about 42 minutes worth, and I think that Laurent Bouzereau is responsible for those from an older release from 2006, and that might be a DVD. I think that might be a DVD release. Um, but so you have Memories of the Dead Zone, which is 12 minutes, and that's interviews with Cronenberg, Brooke Adams, Ronald Sanders, the editor, and uh, an author, Douglas E. Winters, who wrote a book called Stephen King, The Art of Darkness. And uh, then there's one called The Look of the Dead Zone. That's a nine-minute featurette with interviews with Douglas E. Winters, Mark Irwin, the D- director of photography, David Cronenberg, and uh, obviously they're talking about the look of the film. Visions and Horror from the Dead Zone, that's 10 minutes, and that's also Mark Irwin, Cronenberg, uh, talking about the visions of the main character and how they achieve some of that and how Walken performed them. And you know, I think that might be the one where you hear about... Um, the the gun stuff you know the shooting the gun um and then you have the politics of the dead zone that's 11 minutes that's douglas e winters again editor ronald sanders martin sheen cronenberg mark irwin and brooke adams are interviewed for that and um and that's it for those features but you have you know like i said 42 minutes plus another 30 minutes of features plus three commentary tracks and an uh, isolated score track so it's a pretty epic um you know, special collector's edition. So hats off to uh, Screen Factory on this one. I think they did a great job with it, ultimately. <clears throat> so definitely worth checking out, The Dead Zone. And then another new collector's edition, we have House of Wax. This is the 2006 remake, uh, and it is part of the, you know, Dark Castle line of productions that uh, Screen Factory has done a great job of bringing out on Blu-ray. And this is maybe one of my favorite of the Dark Castle movies. It's just a really interesting remake. It's a really interesting adaptation of the film. The original film, of course, starred Vincent Price. And uh, this is a much different film than that. Um, They've decided to take the story and set it instead in a sort of backwoodsy kind of area. And it becomes sort of a scary redneck kind of thing where you have a group of kids who are trying to go to a, um, a football game, uh, like a pro game or a college game. I'm not exactly sure. They have to scalp tickets. I know that. Um, and they are played by, uh, let's see here, uh, Alicia Cuth- Cuthbert, Chad Michael Murray, uh, Brian Van Holt, Paris Hilton, Jared P- Padalecki. Um, and so they are on their way to this thing, and they end up trying to take a shortcut, which is Never a good idea, ever. Don't take shortcuts, people. Um, And so they end up having to pull over for the night and camp by the side of the road, this sort of backwoodsy side road. And there's some weird stuff that happens that I'm not going to get into, but the next day they find out that one of the cars that they had, the fan belt's broken, so they got to walk into town and get a fan belt. So they get a ride from an odd gentleman and then they uh, end up in this small town, which you can kind of see depicted on the front of the box there. And I forget if the town is called Ambrose or what it's called, but um, it seems like a slightly deserted town. Things are a little off. And there is an actual house of wax in the town. And while they're sort of poking around trying to find the guy who runs the service station, they stumble into a funeral, which is really awkward. They, you know, walk through the house of wax, which is a house literally made of wax. The The building itself is made of wax, which plays into the finale of the film, which is a pretty epic, awesome finale. Um, but I don't, again, another one that I'd rather that if people haven't seen it, I don't want to go too much further in terms of what happens. But suffice it to say that uh, this little town is not a nice place to be, and there are some bad people that are out to do some bad things and um you know it it has that very young cast and uh one of the few film roles that i know of for paris hilton i'm sure she had a few but um this is my favorite movie that i think she's in that i can remember um but this is a nice collector's edition so uh that's the slip and the alternate artwork i should have probably flipped it um Looks like that. That's the old classic standby artwork. Now, this has been on Blu-ray before, but this collector's edition, 
uh, add some new features. These are done by Justin Beam's company, uh, Reverend Entertainment, and he does quality work. Um, so let me just go through what is on this new disc in terms of uh, the features. So the new features you get, it's about just under 30 minutes of stuff. You have Die My Darling, an interview with Paris Hilton. That's eight minutes. It's a very nice shot interview, not on Zoom. Um, then you have uh, The Tale of Blake and Page, an interview with actor Robert Richard. It's about five minutes. Um, just sort of just his recollections of the movie and working with Paris and things like that. He plays Paris Hilton's boyfriend in the movie. Um, then there is To Me, They Live and Breathe, which is an interview with special effects artist, uh, makeup effects artist Jason Baird, and that's about nine minutes, and he goes into detail about um, some of the wax people and how they sculpted them and some decisions they made in terms of the texture of the wax and the testing of all that stuff. It's really kind of fascinating. This movie must have been difficult. There's definitely some CG in it, but there's a lot of practical effects, and... It's, it's a better movie for it, I think. Obviously, a lot of people would say that's always the case, but it's a really more powerful movie because of that. So anyway, uh, there's another one called, the last new feature, it's called The Organ Grinder, and that's an interview with composer John Ottman. It's about six minutes, and you know he talks about the score and how he recorded with a big orchestra and a big church, and the score definitely helps. It's got some, some, uh, some power behind it. Um, and then there's some old features from an old uh, Blu-ray or DVD. They look maybe DVD from me. Uh, there's a bloopers like reel, I guess, with uh, cast commentary. So you have Chad Michael Murray, Paris Hilton, Alicia Cuthbert, and I think uh, Jared Padalecki sort of sitting on a couch with a split screen where they're talking about the um, the bloopers or, you know, some things that they recall so it's kind of like a cast commentary too for about 26 minutes something called wax on the design of house of wax about seven minutes uh again that's just uh, all about the design of the the characters and the buildings and the city or the town and which they built the entire little town apparently in this uh movie they didn't shoot in a back lot they actually built it which i think is makes it all the more effective in terms of the remoteness of it. Uh, and then the house built on wax, which is the visual effects of house of wax, another 10 minute piece that talks more specifically about the wax figures and stuff like that and how they did a lot of that stuff. There's also an alternate opening, a gag reel, and there's vintage interviews and featurettes and stuff. Uh, so it's a, you know, pretty well stacked disc with all of that put together. Um, so I enjoyed, uh, revisiting this film and, this is, is it a new scan? I don't think it's a new scan. They don't list that. So uh, it may be a similar scan to the previous Blu-ray, which looks good. You know, Warners takes care of their new, newish masters, and so I thought it looked good. So anyway, that is House of Wax. And now the rest of these I'm going to go through a little bit quicker because I picked these up, and some of these I haven't watched uh, the new discs yet. I may have just dipped my toe in a little bit, but... This used to be a favorite of my daughter's. Uh, Raven is a huge... She, she seems to renounce it now, but there was a time when she couldn't get enough of this movie. Uh, Eight-Legged Freaks, and this one is from 2002. Crazy that that movie is almost 20 years old now. But um, as you can see, it starts David Arquette. Uh, the rest of the cast includes uh, Kari Wurr, uh, Dougie Doug, a very young Scarlett Johansson, uh, Rick Overton, and uh, others, and it's very fun. It's very much, if you're a fan of um, arachnophobia, it's somewhere between that and like an, a 50s monster movie kind of thing. Um, you know, I would say maybe like some, maybe mostly arachnophobia with a little bit of them or something like that. You know, obviously that's an ant movie, not a spider movie, but this is a really interesting giant spider attack, a small town movie, and it has a lot of humor to it, but also a lot of good scares and, um, you know, some people getting wrapped up by spiders and there's a lot of CG spiders, but there's also some practical stuff. And, uh, I just think this movie's a bit underrated for as fun as it is. And I'm a big animal attack guy, so I'm kind of biased, but, uh, I was surprised. Like actually when I showed this to my daughter, I was like, Hey, it's on Blu-ray. She's like, so she's like, that movie had to be on Blu-ray. I'm like, no, it wasn't before this, which is kind of crazy. That's taken this long. Um, but so this is a good one and, and worth watching. 
and has a lot of good features. This is a new 2K scan of the inner positive. Uh, new, uh, it's an invasion, the making of eight-legged freaks, which includes brand new interviews with writer director Ellery uh, Elkayim, producers Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin. They have a lot of interesting things to say about the origins of this and how they found Ellery uh, Elkayim's short film. What he did one about spiders that they thought was just in line with what they they were thinking for this kind of movie and so then they put him on developing a script and he directed this um so they're included as well as dougie doug rick overton and composer john ottman and creature and makeup effects artist bill johnson and an animal trainer named chris rankin as well and then there's an audio commentary by co-stars david arquette and rick overton and ellery l Kayim and dean devlin i think that might have been on the original warner's dvd i'm not sure about that but uh, then also there is uh, something called Eight spine tingling Additional Scenes of Spiders in Action and Ellery Akayam's award-winning short film, Larger Than Life, which I think is the one that Dean Devlin and uh, Roland Emmerich saw um, and that helped led to him getting this movie. But uh, like I said, very excited to finally have this on Blu-ray and it's a nice special edition if you're a fan of that kind of thing. And then we've got a lot of like slashery, stalkery movies coming here, uh, this one just came out. This is a Strangers Watching. This is from director Sean S. Cunningham, who, of course, most known for uh, Friday the 13th. And this movie was his first studio film because, of course, Friday the 13th was not made for Paramount Pictures. It was made independently and then picked up. And uh, this is him working with MGM for the first time. And this is a movie I think very few people talk about. And I think that's unfortunate because it's a pretty interesting more psychological thriller than horror, but it's still pretty good. And the idea is that you have a sort of homicidal, well, psychotic gentleman played by Rip Torn who has decided to kidnap, kidnap a young girl and a TV newswoman played by Kate Mulgrew, who you'll recognize from Voyager. She's Janeway. Um, and he, you know, stalks and kidnaps her and brings her into his lair, which is beneath... New York's Grand Central Station. There's all these tunnels and caves, that, not caves, but just tunnels and stuff. And um, so it's it's pretty creepy, and it's a, it's a matter of, like, he wants a ransom for them, and if he doesn't get it, then uh, he's going to kill them, or maybe he'll kill them anyway. You don't know. Uh, but so it's a sort of a cat and mousey, like, can they outsmart the guy, their captor kind of thing. Um, but it's definitely worth seeing. It's well done. And it's neat to see Sean Cunningham working with a bigger budget, you know, than he had. Uh, and this is a new 2K scan of the inner positive, And there is about a 22 minute interview with Sean Cunningham on this as well, uh, which is definitely worth uh, a look and a listen. I enjoyed that interview. And yeah, this is just a lesser known movie and it's from 1982. Um, moving on. And this is another slasher. Uh, type that's not exactly a slasher this is more of a slasher uh, eyes of a stranger and this one's from 1981 definitely came in the wake of friday the 13th and halloween and um, also deals with a tv newswoman if i am not mistaken and she is played by um uh lauren twos who was uh i think julie on the love boat that's her right there and uh jennifer jason lee is in this one as well and it's sort of about a uh, it says a lovely blind and deaf teen reaches for a plate uh, she just put on the counter. It's gone. She reaches again, and it's back to its original place. Someone is playing a cruel game with her that someone is the serial killer terrorizing Miami in this terrifying thriller from the production company behind the original Friday the 13th and the director of Shockwaves. That's, of course, Ken Wiederhorn. Um, making a memorable movie debuts are Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh as that endangered but not helpless girl and Lauren Twos, I guess this is her feature film debut. She was on Love Boat but not in a feature before. As TV news caster, as her TV newscaster sister, whose investigation inadvertently leads the killer to her home. Um, and yeah, this is a pretty great final sequence, and it's got some pretty gnarly kills, some very brutal uh, attacks on some women. This killer is pretty rough to watch. Um, but uh, there's some really effective slashing kind of going on in here as well. Uh, but it's nice to see this one get uh, Blu-ray. This is not a movie I necessarily expected to see come to Blu-ray. Uh, I don't see anything about the scan, but it definitely looks better than the SD version that I had on DVD prior to this. It has an audio commentary with genre film critic 
Justin Kurzweil and film historian Amanda Reyes, who we're a big fan of here at this channel. And audio interviews with composer Richard Einhorn and actress Peter Dupre. And then something called Turning the Tables, an interview with director Ken Wiederhorn. And the Sunshine State Stalker, an interview with actor John DeSanti, who plays the killer in the film. Something called Master Slashers, an interview with special makeup effects creator Tom Savini and makeup uh, artist Dean Gates. And Tom Savini uh, did work on this movie, I believe, and uh, the movie is better for it in terms of the kills and the gore. Very effective. And I think that's one of the reasons this movie has something of a following still is because of Tom Savini and, and it being a slasher from the period. Um, and another one of that type, more of a thriller, but definitely still a slasher for sure. Um, he Knows You're Alone. Um, actually, it is a slasher. What am I saying? There's a girl killed real early in the movie. Uh, and this one is, a, uh, I think most remembered because it's a very early role for Tom Hanks. Um, and, uh, it says, now you see him. Now you don't. The face of a killer appears out of the darkness just as quickly as it disappears. Um, a young woman has an eerie feeling. Someone is stalking her. Another beauty steps into a shower and a bathroom door handle slowly turns. We're in slasher flick territory and also in a rare realm of film history because, on-screen icon Tom Hanks makes his movie debut in The Shocker. Oh, yeah, this is his first movie. Uh, the up-and-coming legend plays the brief supporting role of Elliot, uh, a psych major. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, the tone of this twisted tale about a sicko who targets brides-to-be and a de detective who scrambles to stop the carnage. Wedding bliss can be very short-lived when he knows you're alone. So you get a sense of what this killer is about and what his M.O. is. And I always think it's interesting, too, that it stars um, Don Scardino, uh, Caitlin O'Heaney, who you can see a little bit right there. Um, and she, for 3 O'Clock High fans, she is the teacher that uh, Jerry Mitchell kisses in his class. Uh, but she's much younger in this role by about five or six years. And uh, so I always find it interesting when a smaller part character that I know very well has a big role in a, in a different film, uh, an earlier film. Uh, so this is a new 2K scan from the Inner Positive, new interviews with director Armand Mastriani, producer Robert DeMilla, Amelia, uh, writer Scott Parker, and actor Don Scardino, audio commentary with Armand Mastriani and Scott Parker. So a pretty nicely done special edition. Both of these um, came out the same time, I think, and they both have some nice features. Moving on quickly... Uh, also with this group, The Hand, this is Oliver Stone's, I believe, debut film. He had had some heat from uh, Alan Parker's film, Midnight Express, which Stone wrote the script for. And so he eventually parlayed that into this film, uh, which is a very interesting... He definitely thinks of it more of a psychological thriller than a horror movie, but it definitely has horror elements. And you can see Michael Caine, of course, headlining the film, and he looks pretty... Um, crazed and he gets pretty nuts in this movie uh, he is a man whose marriage is on the rocks and at one point he and his wife are driving along and he they're in sort of a traffic situation and he is sort of waving uh, I think a car by or something and she ends up stopping and long and short of it like they pass by a, a truck and his hand is clipped and severed and thrown into the side of the road. He loses his right hand, and he happens to be a comic book artist, so it's a pretty devastating uh, injury for him. And then it becomes kind of a, I mean, I would put it in line with something like body parts, but there's no transplant in this case. It's just like he's sort of haunted by the idea of his hand, and uh, the, then people start dying, and it appears the hand is maybe on its own killing people and so he's struggling with dealing with that and it's a pretty big performance from Michael Caine but I think he always you know does the best with the material he's given and I think he is good in the film and Stone there's one of the nice things about this is there's an interview with him I want to say it's almost like 20 minutes long and he definitely has sort of fond recollections of the film I mean he he definitely says that he wished he had a little bit more control over the film at the time he made it but nonetheless, he there are things about it he still likes. There's things he would do differently, of course. But it was neat to hear him in an interview talking about this early work of his, you know. Um, and so that's that was cool. But uh, it also includes 
uh, an interview with producer Edward R. Pressman and actors Andrea Markovici and Annie McEnroe and Bruce McGill, who's in the movie, is a good part. It's Bruce McGill in the film. There's also an audio commentary with Oliver Stone, which I didn't get a chance to listen to yet, but I would like to. I like his commentaries. I was just listening to his commentary on the old, now out-of-print Blu-ray for U-Turn, and that was a really good track from him. I think all his tracks are interesting. Um, so again, another really nicely put together, not even a collector's edition, but I think, you know, almost borders on giving you enough stuff that it could be. So, uh, this is, I, I don't see anything about a new scan on here. Um, this is from 1981. I don't know if I mentioned that, but, uh, one that goes in well with this whole group, you know, uh, very interesting, very interesting. Michael Caine in horror films, I've always found intriguing. You know who else is intriguing in horror films and who did very few of them is Charlton Heston. And this is a this is a weird movie. Uh, the next two I'm going to talk about only have uh, new scans, or actually I don't even know if the next one has a new scan. This is a new 2K scan of the inner positive and no features, but nonetheless I find this movie fascinating. It says two-time Academy Award winner Charlton Heston stars an archaeologist driven to destroy the ancient evil he unleashes when his research causes the awakening. Matthew Corbeck Heston. Uh, is obsessed with finding and opening the tomb of the murderous ancient Egyptian queen Kara to the point of neglecting his pregnant wife, Jill Townsend, uh, even as she delivers their baby. Real classy, Chuck, real classy. Um, uh, But the evil that Corbeck frees takes possession of his newborn daughter. Now 18 years later, Corbeck's daughter, Margaret, Stephanie Zimbalist from Remington Steel, um, returns to Egypt to meet her father for the first time and Corbett must overcome the powerful court occult forces uh, to destroy the evil loosen he loosed upon the world. So it's a really weird thing. Like, you know, he's married, but his assistant is played by Susanna York, and they're kind of in like with each other. And I, I love his uh, little uh, handkerchief there. That's a wonderful. And the shirt open is a nice look. I, I wish I could cultivate that myself. Um, but yeah, so... It's interesting, you know, to see him in this film. This is from 1980, 1980. and, um, you know, it's just, it it doesn't feel like a Hammer film necessarily, but maybe something like that, sort of, uh, in terms of how the vibe is, but just having this weird, you know, ancient uh, spirit possessing your daughter, and it's it gets weird, but it's, for me, it's a good weird. It's a weird where you're just like, huh. Yeah, I haven't seen too many movies just like that one. So uh, I definitely was, even though it's no features at all, uh, I, I still wanted to own this one. I'm a fan. I'm definitely a fan of The Awakening. And then lastly, I have one that I haven't had a chance to watch fully just yet. Uh, but it's got an interesting pedigree about it. Uh, it's called Sphinx. And, oh, this does have a new 2K scan of the inner positive as well. Um, but what's neat about it is... It's directed by Franklin J. Schaffner, who is a director with a lot of interesting credits. Uh, two of the most notable would be uh, the original Planet of the Apes. He directed that. He also directed Papillon with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman and just did some other prestige stuff. And this is from 1981, uh, so a little later for him, but ultimately an interesting entry, and it's based on uh, the book by, or the novel by Robin Cook, and she, I believe her book was the source novel for the movie Coma, which is directed by, uh, Michael Crichton, and which makes a great late 70s thriller, or early 70s, I can't remember where that one lands, but ultimately, um, Robin Cook books into films are intriguing to me, um, it's got a screenplay by John Byram, which is also intriguing, he's the, director who did a movie called inserts which has nothing to do with any of this except that it's a really intriguing uh 1930s hollywood picture about a wonderkin director played by richard dreyfus who's been reduced to shooting pornography in his um his old uh giant house and it's really intriguing film but i didn't realize john byram adapted the book for this one um so anyway this stars leslie ann down and Frank Langella, who I'm a big fan of. I like Frank Langella quite a bit. Uh, and it says, Someone is hunting tourists out of season in this adventure thriller directed by Franklin J. Schaffner uh, and starring Leslie Ann Down and Frank Langella. 
and John Gilgood and oh I noticed um uh, John Rice Davies has at least a small part in it as well so a little Raiders energy is in this too uh, a beautiful dedicated Egyptologist that's Leslie Ann Down finds her life threatened many times while traveling from Cairo to Luxor's Valley of the Kings she's in search of a mysterious tomb of riches which also holds great interest for black marketeers. Based on a novel by Robin Cook, this riveting film delivers twists, turns, and a tale of intrigue you won't soon forget. So not giving away too much of what this movie's about there. Um, so I definitely need to check this out uh, and see just how wacky or not it gets. But uh, previous to this Blu-ray, I think this was on a Warner Archive DVD, which I had bought and I had not watched. So this is a, I do this every so often. I'll have something that I own, and it'll come out on Blu-ray, and I'll be like, well, I haven't watched my DVD yet. And most would say, well, you should watch the DVD first and then get the Blu-ray. But for me, sometimes I'm like, well, now I just need to get this version. I already owned it. I already wanted to see it. So I went ahead and upgraded. Uh, but again, no features, just a new scan and a theatrical trailer. Uh, and that's it for this uh, little video about Scream Factory. Uh, I know they've got uh, a lot of interesting stuff coming this fall, including... Um, I'm wearing my Halloween 3 shirt. There's a bunch of Halloween uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 4Ks coming out from them, which are very exciting. Uh, and there's a whole bunch more stuff on the docket. Uh, I'm just a big fan. I have been since the lab the sub-label uh, started. And they're continuing to do good work and put good features together. And so I just wanted to give them a nice little highlight of their own. And hopefully there's some stuff in here that... Uh, any of you might be interested in checking out. So thank you for watching, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.